Welcome to the Buddhist Bookshelf. In episode 4, we introduce the Sarla's Flowers by Thien Phuc, a treasure of 560 plus Buddha Dharma lessons. Your support, through likes, shares, and subscriptions, is invaluable as we journey through this profound book together. 58. Eight Kinds of Sufferings. Human beings have countless sufferings. Suffering that produce by direct causes or suffering of misery, including physical suffering such as pain, old age, death, as well as mental anxieties. According to most venerable Piyadasi in the Buddha's ancient path all mental and bodily sufferings such as birth, aging, disease, death, association with the unloved, dissociation from the loved, not getting what one wants, are the ordinary sufferings of daily life and are called Dukkha Dukkata. In the Four Noble Truths, Sakyamuni Buddha explained the eight basic causes of suffering. The first suffering is the suffering of birth, or birth is suffering. If we did not have bodies, we would not feel pain and suffering. We experience all sorts of physical suffering through our bodies. While still in the womb, human beings already have feelings and consciousness. They also experience pleasure and pain. When the mother eats cold food, the embryo feels as though it were packed in ice. When hot food is ingested, it feels as though it were burning, and so on. During pregnancy, the embryo, living as it is in a small, dark and dirty place, the mother lose her appetite in sleep, she often vomits and feels very weary. At birth, she suffers from hemorrhage or her life may be in danger in some difficult cases. From then on, all it can do is cry when it feels cold, hot, hungry, thirsty, or suffers insect bites. At the moment of birth, both mother and baby suffer. The mother may suffer from hemorrhage or her life may be in danger in some difficult cases. Sakyamuni Buddha in his wisdom saw all this clearly and in detail, and therefore, described birth as suffering. The ancient sages had a saying in this regard. As soon as sentient beings escape one womb, they enter another. Seeing this, sages and saints are deeply moved to such compassion. The illusory body is really full of filth swiftly escaping from it, we return to our original nature. The Pure Land Buddhism in theory and practice most ben vich dien tam. The second suffering is the suffering of old age, old age is suffering. We suffer when we are subjected to old age, which is natural. As we reach old age, human beings have diminished their faculties, our eyes cannot see clearly anymore, our ears have lost their acuity, our backs ache easily our legs tremble, our eating is not easy and pleasurable as before, our memories fail, our skin dries out and wrinkles, hair becomes gray and white, their teeth ache, decay and fall out. We no longer have much control over our body. In old age, many persons become confused and mixed up when eating or dressing or they become uncontrollable of themselves. Their children and other family members, however close to them, soon grow tired and fed up. The human condition is like that of a flower, ruled by the law of impermanence, which, if it can bring beauty and fragrance, also carries death and decay in its wake. In truth, old age is nothing but suffering, and the human body has nothing worth cherishing. For this reason, Sakyamuni Buddha said. Old age is suffering. Thus, he advised Buddhists to strive to cultivate so they can bear the sufferings of old age with equanimity. The third suffering is the suffering of disease, sickness, or sickness is suffering. The human body is only a temporary combination of the four elements. Earth, water, fire, and wind. Once the four elements are not in balance, we become sick. Sicknesses cause both physical and mental pains and or sufferings. To have a body is to have disease for the body is open to all kinds of diseases. So the suffering of disease is inevitable. Those with small ailments which have an external source to those dreadful diseases coming from inside. Some people are afflicted with incurable diseases such as cancers or debilitating ailments, such as osteoporosis, etc. In such condition, they not only experience physical pain, they also have to spend large sums of money for treatment. Should they lack the required funds, not only do they suffer, they create additional suffering for their families. 
the sufferings caused by diseases is more painful than the sufferings due to old age. Let imagine, even the slightest toothache or headache is sometimes unbearable. However, like or dislike, we have no choice but bearing the suffering of sickness. Even the Buddha, a perfect being, who had destroyed all defilements, had to endure physical suffering caused by disease. The Buddha was constantly subject to headaches. His last illness caused him much physical suffering was a wound in his foot. As a result of Devadatta's hurling a rock to kill him, his foot was wounded by a splinter which necessitated an operation. When his disciples disobeyed his teachings, he was compelled to retire to a forest for three months. In a forest on a couch of leaves on a rough ground, facing fierce and cold winds, he maintained perfect equanimity. In pain and happiness, he lived with a balanced mind. The fourth suffering is the suffering of death or death is suffering. Birth leads inevitably to death. When a person dies, the four elements disperse, and his zirid is dragged off by the karmic wind. Death entails undescribable suffering. All human beings desire an easy birth and a peaceful death, however, very few of us can fulfill these conditions. At the time of death, when the physical body is generally stricken by disease and in great pain. With the body in this state, the mind is panic-stricken, bemoaning the loss of wealth and property, and saddened by the impending separation from loved ones, as well as a multitude of similar thoughts. This is indeed suffering. Sentient beings are born with a cry of pain and die with even more pain. The death is unwanted, but it still comes, and nobody knows when it comes. As fruits fall from a tree, ripe or old even so we die in our infancy, prime of mankind, or old age. As the sun rises in the east only to set in the west. As flowers bloom in the morning to fade in the evening. The Buddha taught. Death is inevitable. It comes to all without exception, we have to cultivate so that we are able to face it with perfect equanimity. The fifth suffering is the suffering due to separation from loved ones, parting with what we love. Parting with what we love is suffering. No one wants to be separated from the loved ones, however, this is inevitable. We still lose our loved ones to the demon of death, leaving them helpless and forsaken. Separation from loved ones, whether in life or through death, is indeed suffering. If we listen to the Buddha's teaching all association in life must end with separation. Here is a good opportunity for us to practice equanimity. The sixth suffering is the suffering due to meeting with the uncongenial, meeting with what we hate, or meeting with what we hate is suffering. People who get along well can work together without any conflict. But sometimes we may detest a person and want to get away from him. Yet, no matter where we go, we keep meeting up with him. The more we hate him, the more we run into him. This is also a form of psychological suffering. To endure those to whom we are opposed, whom we hate, who always shadow and slander us and look for a way to harm us is very hard to tolerate, however, we must confront this almost daily in our life. There are many families in which relatives are not of the same mind and which are constantly beset with disputes, anger and acrimony. This is no different from encountering enemies. This is indeed suffering. Thus, the Buddha advised us to try to bear them, and think this way perhaps we are reaping the effects of our karma, past or present. We should try to accommodate ourselves to the new situation or try to overcome the obstacles by some other means. The seventh suffering is the suffering due to unfulfilled wishes, unattained aims. The suffering of not obtaining what we want. If we seek something, we are greedy for it. If we cannot obtain what we want, we will experience all afflictions and sufferings. That is a kind of psychological suffering. Whether we desire fame, profit, wealth, or sex, if we cannot obtain it, we suffer. Unabling to obtain what we wish is suffering. Our greed is like a container without the bottom. We have so many desires and hopes in our lives. When we want something and are able to get it, this does not often leads to happiness either because it is not long before we feel bored with that thing, lose interest in it, and begin to want something else. In short, we never feel satisfied with what we have at the very moment. The poor hope to be rich, the rich hope to be richer, the ugly desire for beauty, the beauty desire for beautier, 
the childless pray for a son or daughter. Such wishes and hopes are innumerable that no way we can fulfill them. Even if we do obtain what we want, we will not feel happy. Before obtaining it, we are anxious to get it. Once we have got it, we constantly worry about losing it. Our mind is never peaceful or happy. We always feel uneasy. Thus, either obtaining what we wish or not obtaining what we wish is a source of suffering. When we want something but are unable to get it, we feel frustrated. When we expect someone to live or to work up to our expectation and they do not, we feel disappointed. When we want others like us and they don't, we feel hurt. The eighth suffering is the suffering due to the raging aggregates, all the ills of the five skandhas. The five skandhas are forms, feeling, thinking, formations, and consciousness. It is very difficult for us to overcome them. If we lack in meditation practices, it is extremely difficult for us to see their temporary nature. All the illnesses of the five skandhas is suffering. To have a body means to experience pain and diseases on a daily basis. Pain and disease also mean suffering. The five skandhas or aggregates are form, feeling, perception, volition and consciousness. The skandhas of form relates to the physical body, while the remaining four concern the mind. Simply speaking, this is the suffering of the body and the mind. The suffering of the skandhas encompasses the seven kinds of suffering mentioned above. Our physical bodies are subject to birth, old age, disease, death, hunger, thirst, heat, cold and weariness. Our mind, on the other hand, are afflicted by sadness, anger, worry, love, hate and hundreds of other vexations. It once happened that Prince Siddhartha having strolled through the four gates of the city, witnessed the misfortunes of old age, disease and death. Endowed. With profound wisdom, he was touched by the suffering of human condition, and left the royal palace to find the way of liberation. The end of sufferings and affliction is the most important goal of Buddhism, however, this cannot be done through studying, but one must practice with your personal experiences. When we speak of the end of sufferings and afflictions in Buddhism, we mean the end of sufferings and afflictions in this very life, not waiting until a remote life. Sincere Buddhists should always remember that nirvana in Buddhism is simply a place where there are no sufferings and afflictions. So if we can cultivate ourselves to eliminate sufferings and afflictions, we reach what we call nirvana in this very life. To end sufferings and afflictions, selfish desire must be removed. Just as a fire dies when no fuel is added, so unhappiness will end when the fuel of selfish desire is removed. When selfish desire is completely removed, our mind will be in a state of perfect peace. We shall be happy always. Buddhists call the state in which all suffering is ended nirvana. It is an everlasting state of great joy and peace. It is the greatest happiness in life. The Eightfold Path to the Cessation of Dukkha and Afflictions, enumerated in the Fourth Noble Truth, is the Buddha's prescription for the suffering experienced by all beings. It is commonly broken down into three components. Morality, Concentration and Wisdom. Another approach identifies a path beginning with charity, the virtue of giving. Charity or generosity underlines morality or precept, which in turn enables a person to venture into higher aspirations. Morality, concentration and wisdom are the core of Buddhist spiritual training and are inseparably linked. They are not merely appendages to each other like petals of a flower, but are intertwined like salt in great ocean to invoke a famous Buddhist simile. 59. Leakage. General meanings of leaking is an opening on the roof allows rain water to descend through it. In Buddhism, leakage means afflictions. Whatever is in the stream of births and deaths. Conditioned merits and virtues lead to rebirth within samsara. According to the Mahayana Buddhism, asrava has the following meanings. Taint, corruption, mania, and fatuation, addiction, to alcohol or drugs, defilement, and so on. Leaking, asrava, is something which oozes or flows out of the mind and spoils the upward career of the Buddhist life, to get rid of asrava is the aim of our cultivation. In the contrary, Anasrava is a state free from these impurities. Leaking is also anything which serves to divert beings away from inherent Buddha nature. 
outflows are so-called because they are turning of energy and attention outward rather than inward. According to the Visuddhimagga, the path of purification, cankers, a term for greed for sense desire, greed for becoming, wrong view, and ignorance, because of the exiting of these defilements from unguarded sense doors like water from cracks in a pot in the sense of constant trickling, or because of their producing the suffering of the round of rebirths. First, the floods are so called in the sense of sweeping away into the ocean of becoming, and in the sense of being hard to cross. Second, the bonds are so called because they do not allow disengagement from an object and disengagement from suffering. Both floods and bonds are terms for the cankers already mentioned. According to Buddhism, leakage is the conditioned dharma which produces afflictions, passions and delusions. Whatever is in the stream of births and deaths. Even conditioned merits and virtues lead to rebirth within samsara. There are many kinds of outflows. Anger is an outflow so are greed and ignorance. Outflows are the root of birth and death, and the reason for us not to end the cycle of birth and death is that we still have outflows. Besides, in Buddhism there are other definitions that are related to leaking. Leaking in precepts means to make a leak in the commandments, i.e. beak them. Karma of ordinary. Rebirth means the deeds of the sinner in the stream of transmigration, which produces his karma. Ending of leakage means the end of the passions or the exhaustion of the stream of transmigration. The assurance of ending of leakage means the assurance or realization that the stream of transmigration is ended and nirvana attained. The realization of ending of leakage means the realization that the stream of transmigration is ended. Another word, nirvana insight into present mortal sufferings, so as to overcome all passions or temptations, or the deliverance of mind from passions. The insight of ending of the leakage means the supernatural insight into the ending of the stream of transmigration, one of the six abhijnas. The wisdom of ending of the leakage means the wisdom of the arat, all passions and afflictions ended. Ending of leakage bhiksu means the monk who has ended the stream of transmigration, or the arat. The mind of ending of the leakage means the passions ended and the mind freed, or the state of the arat. The confidence of ending of the leakage means absolute confidence of Buddha that transmigration would cease forever. There are two basic aspects of illusion. The first illusion is the illusion connected with views. These are perplexities or illusions, and temptations arise from false views or theories. The second illusion is the illusion connected with thoughts. These illusions arise through contact with the world or by habit, such as desire, anger, infatuation, etc. Besides, there are also illusion connected with principles and delusion arising in practice. According to the Tiantai sect, there are three delusions. The first illusion is connected with thoughts. Things seen in thought illusions from imperfect perception, with temptation to love, hate, etc. To be rid of these false views and temptations, one must cultivate and observe moral precepts. The second illusion is the illusion connected with affliction. Illusion and temptation through the immense variety of duties in saving others. The third illusion is the illusion connected with ignorance. Illusions and temptations that arise from failure philosophically to understand things in their reality. Illusion arising from primal ignorance which covers and hinders the truth. In the differentiated teaching, this illusion is overcome by the bodhisattva from the first stage. In the perfect teaching, it is overcome by the bodhisattva in the first resting place. According to the Hinayana Buddhism, there are three groups of delusions. The first delusion is the illusion connected with desires, kamasava p. Intoxicant of worldly desires or sensual pleasures. The second delusion is the illusion connected with existence, babasava p. The love of existence in one of the conditioned realms. The third illusion is the illusion connected with ignorance, avijasava p. The defilements of ignorance in mind. Besides, some considers the fourth delusion. The corruption of views. According to the connected discourses of the Buddha, chapter Asanavago, searches, there are three affluences or taints that feed the stream of mortality or transmigration. The first illusion is the illusion connected with desires, or the taint of sensuality. The second illusion is the illusion connected with material or phenomenal existence, or the taint of existence. 
The third illusion is the illusion connected with ignorance, ignorance of the way of escape, or the taint of ignorance. For these reasons, from the moment to moment enlightening beings enter absorption and extinction and exhaust all contamination, yet they do not experience ultimate reality and do not end roots of goodness with contamination, though they know all things are free from contamination, yet they know the end and extinction of contaminations. Though they know the principles of Buddhas are identical to the things of the world, and the things of the world are identical to the principles of Buddhas, yet they do not form notions of worldly things within the principles of Buddhas, and do not form notions of principles of Buddhas in the things of the world. All things enter the realm of reality because there is nothing entered, they know all things are non-dual because there is no change. According to Bhikkhu Bodhi and Abhidhamma, there are 63 entities. There are four taints of the unwholesome. The taint of sensual desire, the taint of attachment to existence, the taint of wrong views, and the taint of ignorance. There are four floods. The flood of sensual desire, the flood of attachment to existence, the flood of wrong views, and the flood of ignorance. Four bonds. The bond of sensual desire, the bond of attachment to existence, the bond of wrong views, and the bond of ignorance. There are four bodily knots or ties. The bodily knot of covetousness, the bodily knot of ill will, the bodily knot of adherence to rites and ceremonies, and the bodily knot of dogmatic belief that this alone is the truth. Four bodily clingings. Clinging to sense pleasures, clinging to wrong views, clinging to rites and ceremonies, and clinging to a doctrine of self. Six hindrances. The hindrance of sensual desire, the hindrance of ill will, the hindrance of sloth and torpor, the hindrance of restlessness and worry, the hindrance of doubt, and the hindrance of ignorance. Seven latent dispositions. Sensual lust, attachment to existence, aversion, conceit, wrong views, doubt, and ignorance. Ten fetters, according to the Satanta method. The fetter of sensual lust, attachment to fine material existence, attachment in immaterial existence, the fetter of aversion, the fetter of conceit, the fetter of wrong views, adherence to rites and ceremonies, the fetter of doubt, the fetter of restlessness, and the fetter of ignorance. Ten fetters, according to the Abhidhamma. The fetter of sensual lust, attachment to existence, the fetter of aversion, the fetter of conceit, the fetter of wrong views, adherence to rites and ceremonies, the fetter of doubt, the fetter of envy, the fetter of avarice, and the fetter of ignorance. 10 Defilements. The defilement of greed, the defilement of hatred, the defilement of delusion, the defilement of conceit, the defilement of wrong views, and I hoek. The defilement of doubt, the defilement of sloth, the defilement of restlessness, and the defilement of shamelessness. 60. Cultivate more good deeds. Good deeds can be going to a temple to do good deeds there, but good deeds can be what we do to make others happier or moraler, so that they can come closer to enlightenment and emancipation. Devout Zen practitioners should always remember that before entering meditation practices, we should do a lot of good deeds, for the level of mind stillness depends not only on methods of Zen, but also greatly depends the good deeds that we accomplished. If we are not completely emancipated, our happiness in meditation also synonymous with the happiness that we did for others. Therefore, a Zen practitioner must be the one who always gives the happiness, peace, and mindfulness to others all his life. In other words, desire the effort for meditation, Zen practitioners should always try to do many good deeds, for good deeds will support meditation result very well. 61. To see the real nature of pride. Pride is the inflated opinion of ourselves and can manifest in relation to some good or bad object. When we look down from a high mountain, everyone below seems to have shrunken in size. When we hold ourselves to be superior to others and have an inflated opinion of ourselves, we take on a superior aspect. It is extremely difficult to develop any good qualities at all when one has pride, for no matter how much the teacher may teach that person, it will do no good. Haughtiness means false arrogance, thinking oneself correct in spite of one's wrong conduct, thinking oneself is good in spite of one's very bad in reality. 
Haughtiness also means arrogance and conceit due to one's illusion of having completely understood what one has hardly comprehended at all. Haughtiness is one of the main hindrances in our cultivation. Zen will help us to possess a genuine wisdom which is necessary for our cultivation. Those who have genuine wisdom never praise themselves and disparage others. These people never consider themselves the purest and loftiest, and other people common and lowly. In Buddhism, those who praise themselves have no future in their cultivation of the way. Even though they are still alive, they can be considered as dead, for they have gone against their own conscience and integrity. The state of suffering of envy. Devout Buddhists should always remember that envy is generated by one's feeling of inferiority, while pride, haughtiness, and arrogance are born from a false sense of superiority. These kinds of pride and arrogance are caused by looking at things from a distorted, self-centered point of view. Those who have truly understood the Buddha's teachings and been able to obtain a right view of things will never succumb to such warped thinking. Jealousy means to be jealous of another person thinking he or she has more talent than we do, to become envious of the who surpass us in one way or other. Jealousy can be a consuming fire in our mind, a state of suffering. In meditation, if we want to eliminate jealousy, we should see and feel it without judgment or condemnation for judgment and condemnation only nourish jealousy in our mind. 62. The Real Nature of Doubt Doubt signifies spiritual doubt, from a Buddhist perspective, the inability to place confidence in the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, and the training. Doubt is one of the five hindrances one must eliminate on entering the stream of saints. In fact, one who suffers from perplexity is really suffering from a dire disease, and unless he sheds his doubts, he will continue to worry over and suffer from this illness. As long as man is subject to this mental itch, this sitting on the fence, he will continue to take a skeptical view of things which is most detrimental to mental ability to decide anything definitely, it also includes doubt with regard to the possibility of attaining the jhanas. However, doubting is natural. Everyone starts with doubts. We can learn a great deal from them. What is important is that we do not identify with our doubts. That is, do not get caught up in them, letting our mind spin in endless circles. Instead, watch the whole process of doubting, of wondering. See who it is that doubts. See how doubts come and go. Then we will no longer be victimized by our doubts. We will step outside of them, and our mind will be quiet. We can see how all things come and go. Let go of our doubts and simply watch. This is how to end doubting. 63. The Real Nature of Wrong Views In Buddhism, improper views or wrong views means not recognizing the doctrine of normal karma. Perverted, wrong, views or opinions, not consistent with the Dharma, one of the five heterodox opinions in Ten Evils. In fact, there is no specific definition for the term wrong views, mikaditi, in Buddhism. During the Buddha's time, the Buddha confirmed his disciples that even the validity of the Buddha's own statements could be questioned. The Buddha claimed no authority for his doctrine except his own experience. Perverted, wrong, views or opinions arises from a misconception of the real characteristic of existence. There were at least 62 heretical views, views of the externalist or non-Buddhist views, in the Buddha's time. Buddhism emphasizes on theory of causation. Understanding the theory of causation means to solve most of the question of the causes of sufferings and afflictions. Not understanding or refuse of understanding of the theory of causation means a kind of wrong view in Buddhism. According to the Buddha, sentient beings suffer from sufferings and afflictions because of desires, aversions, and delusion, and the causes of these harmful actions are not only from ignorance, but also from wrong views. Through Zen, we can see that holding wrong views involves vigorously and hostily denying the existence of such things as past and future lives, the possibility of attaining nirvana. Wrong views mean the false belief that the skandhas, or constituents of personality, contain an immortal soul. False view also means seeing wrongly. Its characteristic is unwise or unjustified interpretation or belief. Its function is to preassume. It is manifested as a wrong interpretation or belief. 
its proximate cause is unwillingness to see the noble ones. Holding wrong views in Buddhism involves vigorously and hostily denying the existence of such things as past and future lives, the possibility of attaining nirvana, the existence of the Buddhas, Dharma and Sangha. Doubt about these subjects does not constitute wrong views, however, if we neglect to resolve our doubts by asking questions and investigating these issues, we could later generate wrong views by believing in deceptive doctrines. 65. To overcome greed, anger, and jealousy. To refrain from greed, anger, jealousy, and other evil thoughts to which people are subject, we need strength of mind, strenuous effort and vigilance. When we are free from the city life, from nagging preoccupation with daily life, we are not tempted to lose control, but when we enter in the real society, it becomes an effort to check these troubles. Meditation will contribute an immense help to enable us to face all this with calm. There are only two points of divergence between the deluded and the enlightened, i.e., Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Purity is Buddhahood, defilement is the state of sentient beings. Because the Buddhas are in accord with the pure mind, they are enlightened, fully endowed with spiritual powers and wisdom. Because sentient beings are attached to worldly dusts, they are deluded and revolve in the cycle of birth and death. To practice pure land is to go deep into the Buddha recitation samadhi, awakening to the original mind and attaining Buddhahood. Therefore, if any deluded agitated thought develops during Buddha recitation, it should be severed immediately, allowing us to return to the state of the pure mind. This is the method of counteracting afflictions with the meditating mind. 66. Heedlessness and giving free rein to one's emotion. The Buddha knows very well the mind of human beings. He knows that the foolish indulge in heedlessness, while the wise protect heedfulness. So he advises the wise with right effort, heedfulness and discipline, to build up an island which no flood can overflow. Who is heedless before but afterwards heedless no more, will outshine this world, like a moon free from clouds. To the Buddhas, a person who has conquered thousands of thousands of people in the battlefield cannot be compared with a person who is victorious over himself because he is truly a supreme winner. A person who controls himself will always behave in a self-tamed way. And a self well-tamed and restrained becomes a worthy and reliable refuge, very difficult to attain. A person who knows how to sit alone, to sleep alone, to walk alone, to subdue oneself alone, will take delight in living in deep forests. Such a person is a trustworthy teacher because being well tamed himself, he then instructs others accordingly. So the Buddha advises the well tamed people to control themselves. Only the well tamed people, the heedful people, know the way to stop contentions, quarrels and disputes, and how to live in harmony, in friendliness and in peace. To overcome the heedlessness before practicing meditation, Devout Buddhists should always remember the Buddha's teachings in the Dharmapada Sutra. One who conquers himself is greater than one who is able to conquer a thousand men in the battlefield. Self-conquest is, indeed, better than the conquest of all other people. To conquer oneself, one must be always self-controlled and disciplined one's action. One's self is indeed one's own savior, who else could be the savior? With self-control and cultivation, one can obtain a wonderful savior. Whoever was formerly heedless and afterwards overcomes his sloth, such a person illuminates this world just like the moon when freed from clouds. Before teaching others, one should act himself as what he teaches. It is easy to subdue others, but to subdue oneself seems very difficult. He who sits alone, sleeps alone, walks and stands alone, unwearied, he controls himself, will find joy in the forest. You are your own protector. You are your own refuge. Try to control yourself as a merchant controls a noble steed. 68. Selflessness. Buddhism teaches that human beings' bodies are composed of five aggregates, called skandhas in Sanskrit. If the form created by the four elements is empty and without self, then human beings' bodies, created by the unification of the five skandhas, must also be empty and without self. Human beings' bodies are involved in a transformation process from second to second, minute to minute, continually experiencing impermanence in each moment. By looking very deeply into the five skandhas, 
we can experience the selfless nature of our bodies, our passage through birth and death, and emptiness, thereby destroying the illusion that our bodies are permanent. In Buddhism, no self is the most important subject for meditation. By meditating no self, we can break through the barrier between self and other. When we no longer are separate from the universe, a completely harmonious existence with the universe is created. We see that all other human beings exist in us, and that we exist in all other human beings. We see that the past and the future are contained in the present moment, and we can penetrate and be completely liberated from the cycle of birth and death. An Atman in Sanskrit means the impersonality, insubstantiality, or not self. The doctrine of no self has two main characteristics selflessness of things, dharma naratnya, and selflessness of person, pajalanaratnya. Sometimes, the teaching of not self causes confusion and misunderstanding. Any time we speak, we do say I am speaking or I am talking, etc. How can we deny the reality of that I? Sincere Buddhists should always remember that the Buddha never asked us to reject the use of the name or term I. The Buddha himself still use a word tathagata to refer to himself, no matter what is the meaning of the word, it is still a word or a name. When the Buddha taught about not-self, he stressed on the rejection of the idea that this name or term I stands for a substantial, permanent and changeless reality. The Buddha said that the five aggregates, form, feeling, perception, volition and consciousness, were not the self, and that the self was not to be found in them. The Buddha's rejection of the self is a rejection of the belief in a real, independent permanent entity that is represented by the name or term I, for such a permanent entity would have to be independent, permanent, immutable and impervious to change, but such a permanent entity and or such a self is nowhere to be found. When Sakyamuni Buddha put forth the notion of no self he upsets many concepts about life in the universe. He blasted our most firm and widespread conviction, that of a permanent self. Those who understand not self know that its function is to overthrow self, not to replace it with a new concept of reality. The notion of not self is a method, not a goal. If it becomes a concept, it must be destroyed along with all other concepts. Zen practitioners should always remember about the no self of body mind environment. No self means that there is no self no permanent nature per se, and that we are not true masters of ourselves. This point, too, is divided into the no-self body, the no-self mind, and the no-self environment. The no-self body means that this body is illusory, not its own master. It cannot be kept eternally young or prevented from decaying and dying. Even gods and immortals can only postpone death for a certain period of time. The no-self of mind refers to the deluded mind of sentient beings, which has no permanent nature. For example, the mind of greed, thoughts of sadness, anger, love, and happiness, suddenly arise and then disappear, there is nothing real. No-self of environment means that our surroundings are illusory, passive and subject to birth and decay. Cities and towns are in time replaced by abandoned mounds, mulberry fields soon give way to the open seas. Every single thing changes and fluctuates by the second, one landscape disappears, and another takes its place. The Buddha used the following analysis to prove that the self is nowhere to be found either in the body or the mind. The body is not the self, for if the body were the self, the self would be impermanent, would be subject to change, decay, destruction, and death. Hence the body cannot be the self. The self does not possess the body in the sense that I possess a car or a television, because the self cannot control the body. The body falls ill, gets tired and old against our wishes. The body has an appearance, which often does not agree with our wishes. Hence in no way does the self possess the body. The self does not exist in the body. If we search our bodies from top to bottom, we can find nowhere locate the so-called self, the self is not in the bone or in the blood, in the marrow or in the hair or spittle. The self is nowhere to be found within the body. The body does not exist in the self. For the body to exist in the self, the self would have to be found apart from the body and mind, but the self is nowhere to be found.
the mind is not the self because, like the body, the mind is subject to constant change and is agitated like a monkey. The mind is happy one moment and unhappy the next. Hence the mind is not the self because the mind is constantly changing. The self does not possess the mind because the mind becomes excited or depressed against our wishes. Although we know that certain thoughts are wholesome and certain thoughts unwholesome, the mind pursues unwholesome thoughts and is different toward wholesome thoughts. Hence the self does not possess the mind because the mind acts independently of the self. The self does not exist in the mind. No matter how carefully we search the contents of our minds, no matter how we search our feelings, ideas, and inclinations, we can nowhere find the self in the mind in the mental states. The mind does not exist in the self because again the self would have to exist apart from the mind and body, but such a self is nowhere to be found. We should reject the idea of a self for two reasons. 1. As long as we still cling to the self, we will always have to defend ourselves, our property, our prestige, opinions, and even our words. But once we give up the belief in an independent and permanent self, we will be able to live with everyone in peace and pleasure. 2. The Buddha taught. Understanding not self is a key to great enlightenment, for the belief in a self is synonymous with ignorance, and ignorance is the most basic of the three afflictions, greed, anger, and stupidity. Once we identify, imagine, or conceive ourselves as an entity, we immediately create a schism, a separation between ourselves and the people and things around us. Once we have this conception of self, we respond to the people and things around us with either attachment or aversion. That's the real danger of the belief of a self. Thus, the rejection of the self is not only the key of the end of sufferings and afflictions, but it is also a key to the entrance of the great enlightenment. Zen practitioners should contemplate no self in every step. Zen practitioners can comprehend these three characteristics by observing closely the mere lifting of the foot and the awareness of the lifting of the foot. By paying close attention to the movements, we see things arising and disappearing, and consequently we see for ourselves the impermanent, unsatisfactory, and non-self nature of all conditioned phenomena. 69. The selflessness impermanence of all things. To understand thoroughly the impermanence of all things, Zen practitioners should contemplate that all things in this world, including human life, mountains, rivers, and political systems, are constantly changing from moment to moment. This is called impermanence in each moment. Everything passes through a period of birth, maturity, transformation, and destruction. This destruction is called impermanence in each cycle. To see the impermanent nature of all things, we must examine this closely. Doing so will prevent us from being imprisoned by the things of this world. Buddhism teaches that human beings' bodies are composed of five aggregates, called skandhas in Sanskrit. If the form created by the four elements is empty and without self, then human beings' bodies, created by the unification of the five skandhas, must also be empty and without self, Human beings' bodies are involved in a transformation process from second to second, minute to minute, continually experiencing impermanence in each moment. By looking very deeply into the five skandhas, we can experience the selfless nature of our bodies, our passage through birth and death, and emptiness, thereby destroying the illusion that our bodies are permanent. In Buddhism, no self is the most important subject for meditation. By meditating no self, we can break through the barrier between self and other. When we no longer are separate from the universe, a completely harmonious existence with the universe is created. We see that all other human beings exist in us, and that we exist in all other human beings. We see that the past and the future are contained in the present moment, and we can penetrate and be completely liberated from the cycle of birth and death. 79. Ignorance. A Sanskrit term avidyu means ignorance. In Buddhism, avidyu is non-cognizance of the Four Noble Truths, the Three Precious Ones, Taratna, and the Law of Karma, etc. Avidyu is the first link of conditionality, Pratityasampada, which leads to entanglement of the world of samsara, and the root of all unwholesome in the world. This is the primary factor that enmeshes, Lam Vung view, beings in the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. 
in a Buddhist sense, it refers to lack of understanding of the Four Noble Truths, Arya Satya, the effects of actions, karma, dependent arising, pratitya samatpada, and other key Buddhist doctrines. In Madhyamaka, avidya refers to the determination of the mind through ideas and concepts that permit beings to construct an ideal world that confers upon the everyday world its forms in manifold quality and that thus block vision of reality. Avidya is thus the non-recognition of the true nature of the world, which is empty, shunyata, and the mistaken understanding of the nature of phenomena. Thus avidya has a double function. Ignorance veils the true nature and also constructs the illusory appearance. Avidya characterizes the conventional reality. For the Sautrantikas and Vipassakas, avidya means seeing the world as unitary and enduring, whereas in reality it is manifold and impermanent. Avidya confers substantiality on the world and its appearances. In the Yogacara's view, avidya means seeing the object as a unit independent of consciousness, when in reality it is identical with it. Ignorance means unenlightened, the first or last of the twelve nidanas. Ignorance is illusion or darkness without illumination, the ignorance which mistakes seeming for being or illusory phenomena for realities. Ignorance of the way of escape from sufferings, one of the three affluences that feed the stream of mortality or transmigration. Sometimes ignorance means my or illusion. It means complete darkness without illumination. The ignorance which mistakes seeming for being or illusory phenomena for realities. Ignorance is the main cause of our non-enlightenment. Ignorance us only a false mark, so it is subject to production, extinction, increase, decrease, defilement, purity, and so on. Ignorance is the main cause of our birth, old age, worry, grief, misery, and sickness, and death. Ignorance is one of the three fires which must be allowed to die out before nirvana is attained. The erroneous state of mind which arises from belief in self. In Zen, ignorance is not seeing things as they really are. It is failing to understand the truth about life. As long as we have not developed our minds to obtain wisdom, we remain ignorant of the true nature of things. According to Buddhism, ignorance means regarding the self as real. Due to ignorance, people do not see things as they really are and cannot distinguish between right and wrong. They become blind under the delusion of self, clinging to things which are impermanent, changeable, and perishable. One's anger arises, one has nothing but ignorance. In order to eliminate ignorance you should meditate on causality. All of our psychological problems are rooted in ignorance, in delusion. Ignorance is the crowning corruption. Our greeds, hates, conceits and a host of other defilements go hand in hand with our ignorance. The solutions are to be found in the problems themselves, and hence we should not run away from our problems. Analyze and scrutinize the problems, and you will see that they are human problems, so do not attribute them to non-humans. Our real problems can be solved only by giving up illusions and false concepts and bringing our lives into harmony with reality, and this can be done only through meditation. Ignorance is also thoughts and impulses that try to draw us away from emancipation. If we wish to liberate ourselves from these hindrances, we should first recognize them through meditation. Just as the Buddha described in his discourses how he would exclaim, Mara! I see you! Zen practitioners should remember that the purpose of disciplined meditation practice is to eliminate ignorance, to open the essential nature of mind, and to stabilize awareness. Through meditation, we concentrate on things with an undistracted awareness. We are not thinking about anything, not analyzing, not getting lost in flux of things, but just seeing the nature of what is happening in the mind. Through practices of meditation, our mind becomes clearer and clearer, it is to say ignorance is gradually eliminated through the course of meditation. If you think that your mind can only be opened by a certain master out there, you are never cultivating in accordance with Buddhism at all. If you think someone out there can eliminate ignorance for you, you are not a devout Buddhist. 71. Human's Life. The present birth is brought about by the craving and clinging karma volition, tanha upadana, of past births, and the craving and clinging acts of will of the present birth bring about future rebirth. According to Buddhism, 
It is this karma volition that divides beings into high and low. According to Dhammapada, 135, beings are hearers of their deeds, bearers of their deeds, and their deeds are the womb out of which they spring, and through their deeds alone they must change for the better, remark themselves, and win liberation from ill. According to modern biology, a new human life begins in that miraculous instant when a sperm cell from the father merges with an egg cell or ovum within the mother. This is the moment of birth. Science speaks of only these two physical common factors. Buddhism, however, speaks of a third factor which is purely mental. According to the Mahatnhasamkaya Sutta in Majjhima Nikaya, by the conjunction of three factors does conception take place. If mother and father come together, but it is not the mother's proper season, and the being to be reborn, Gandhava, does not present itself, a germ of life is not planted. If the parents come together, and it is the mother's proper season, but the being to be reborn is not present, then there is no conception. If the mother and father come together, and it is the mother's proper season and the being to be reborn is also present, then a germ of life is planted there. The third factor is simply a term for the rebirth consciousness, Padasandi Vinana. It should be clearly understood that this rebirth consciousness is not a self or a soul or an ego entity that experiences the fruits of good and evil deeds. Consciousness is also generated by conditions. Apart from condition there is no arising of consciousness. According to most venerable Piyudasi in the Buddha's ancient path, life according to Buddhism is suffering, suffering dominates all life. It is the fundamental problem of life. The world is suffering and afflicted, no being is free from this bond of misery, and this is a universal truth that no sensible man who sees things in their proper perspective can deny. The recognition of this universal fact, however, is not totally denial of pleasure or happiness. The Buddha, the Lord over suffering, never denied happiness in life when he spoke of the universality of suffering. The psychophysical organism of the body undergoes incessant change, creates new psychophysical processes every instant, and thus preserves the potentiality for future organic processes, and leaves the gap between one moment and the next. We live and die every moment of our lives. It is merely a coming into being and passing away, a rise and fall, Udayubhaya, like the waves of the sea. This change of continuity, the psychophysical process, which is patent to us this life does not cease at death, but continues incessantly. It is the dynamic mind flux that is known as will, thirst, desire, or craving which constitutes karmic energy. This mighty force, this will to live, keeps life going. According to Buddhism, it is not only human life, but the entire sentient world that is drawn by this tremendous force, this mind with its mental factors, good or bad. Life is uncertain, death is certain. This is a well-known saying in Buddhism. Knowing fully well that death is certain and is the natural phenomenon that Varian has to face, we should not be afraid of death. Yet all of us fear death because we do not think of its inevitability. We like to cling to our life and body and develop too much craving and detachment. A German monk named Nain Adiloka reiterated the momentariness of existence from the Sudi Magga as follows. All beings have only a very short instant to live, only so long as a moment of the slash of a lightning. When this is extinguished, the being is also extinguished. The beings of the last moment is now no longer living and does not live now or will not live again later. The being of the present moment did not live previously, lives just now, but later will not live anymore. The being of the future has not lived yet in the past, does not yet live now, and will only live later. In fact, this life is a long dream. Even when we wake up after our night's sleep, is there any difference among the dreams we had last night and the years of our childhood? We feel that we are reincarnating every morning after the sleep or we feel that we are reincarnating every moment after the breath. Thus, is there any real us in this process of reincarnation? Surely, not at all. As a matter of fact, we have been changing endlessly. And we know we are the thoughts being manifested. That's all. Human beings have both pleasure and suffering, thus it's easy for them to advance in cultivation and to attain Buddhahood.
whereas the beings in the Deva realm enjoy all kinds of joy and spend no time for cultivation, beings in the realms of animals, hungry ghosts and hells are stupid, living in filth and killing one another for food. They are so miserable with all kinds of sufferings that no way they can cultivate. However, of all precious jewels, life is the greatest, if there is life, it is the priceless jewel. Thus, if you are able to maintain your livelihood, someday you will be able to rebuild your life. However, everything in life, if it has form characteristics, then, inevitably, one day it will be destroyed. A human life is the same way, if there is life, there must be death. Even though we say a hundred years, it passes by in a flash, like lightning streaking across the sky, like a flower's blossom, like the image of the moon at the bottom of a lake, like a short breath, what is really eternal? Sincere Buddhists should always remember when a person is born, not a single dime is brought along, therefore, when death arrives, not a word will be taken either. A lifetime of work, putting the body through pain and torture in order to accumulate wealth and possessions, in the end everything is worthless and futile in the midst of birth, old age, sickness, and death. After death, all possessions are given to others in a most senseless and pitiful manner. At such time, there are not even a few good merits for the soul to rely and lean on for the next life. Therefore, such an individual will be condemned into the three evil paths immediately. Ancient sages taught. A steel tree of a thousand years once again blossom, such a thing is still not bewildering, but once a human body has been lost, ten thousand reincarnations may not return. Sincere Buddhists should always remember what the Buddha taught. It is difficult to be reborn as a human being, it is difficult to encounter, meet or learn, the Buddha Dharma, now we have been reborn as a human being, and encountered the Buddha Dharma, if we let the time passes by in vain, we waste our scarce lifespan. According to the Sutra in 42 sections, Chapter 38, the Buddha asked his Ramana. How long is the human lifespan? He replied. A few days. The Buddha said. You have not yet understood the way. The Buddha asked another Sramana. How long is the human lifespan? The other replied. The space of a meal. The Buddha said. You still have not yet understood the way. The Buddha then asked another Sramana. How long is the human lifespan? The last one replied. The length of a single breath. The Buddha said. Excellent. You understand the way. The Buddha taught on many occasions. Human life is only as long as one breath, for breathing out, exhaling, without breathing, inhaling, means we have already died and stepped over into a new lifetime. In fact, our lives are like the breath, or like the growing and falling leaves. In the old days, at temples, the novices always must sweep falling leaves together on the open grounds and walkways of the monasteries. The leaves fall, the novices sweep, and yet, even while the sweeping continues and the near end of a long path is being clear, the novices can look back to the far end they have already swept and see a new scattering of leaves already starting to cover their work. When we can really understand about falling leaves, we can sweep the paths every day and have great happiness in our lives on this changing earth. In the Dharmapada Sutra, the Buddha taught, it is difficult to obtain birth as a human being, it is difficult to have a life of mortals, it is difficult to hear the correct law, it is even rare to meet the Buddha, Dharmapada 182. Here I shall live in the rainy season, here in the winter and the summer. These are the words of the fool. He fails to realize the danger of his final destination, Dharmapada 286. Death descends and carries away that man of drowsy mind greedy for children and cattle, just like flood sweeps away a sleeping village, Dharmapada 287. Nothing can be saved, nor sons, nor a father, nor even relatives, there is no help from kinsmen can save a man from death, Dharmapada 288. Thus, the Buddha continued to teach. To live a hundred years, immoral and uncontrolled, is no better than a single day life of being moral and meditative, Dharmapada 110. To live a hundred years without wisdom and control, is no better than a single day life of being wise and meditative, Dharmapada 111.
to live a hundred years, idle and inactive, is no better than a single day life of intense effort, Dharmapada 112. To live a hundred years without comprehending how all things rise and pass away, is no better than a single day life of seeing beginning and end of all things, Dharmapada 113. To live a hundred years without seeing the immortal state, is no better than a single day life of one who sees the deathless state, Nirvana, Dharmapada. 114. To live a hundred years without seeing the supreme truth, is no better than a single day life of someone who see the highest law, Dharmapada 115. 72. Modern world. The world today is not what it was half a century ago. Ideas of good and bad are fast changing, attitudes toward moral and immoral conduct are different, and the general outlook on men and things is also very different. We are living in an age of Russian speed. It is tension, tension everywhere. If you stand at the corner of a busy street and scan the faces of the people hurrying feverishly by, you will notice that most of them are restless. They carry with them an atmosphere of stress. They are most pictures of Russian worry. Rarely will you find a picture of calm, content and repose in any of these faces. Such is the modern world. The world of today is characterized by inordinate haste, leading to quick decisions and imprudent actions. Some shout when they could speak in normal tones and other talk excitedly at a forced pitch for long periods and finish a conversation almost exhausted. Any kind of excitement is a stress in the psychologist's sense of the word, and stress causes the speeding up of bodily processes. It is not seldom that a person driving a vehicle gets agitated on seeing the green color of the traffic lights giving place to amber. The anxious man regards even a minor event as if it were a crisis or a threat. As a result man is worried and unhappy. Another feature of the modern world is its noisiness. Music hatch charms they say, but today, even such music is not agreeable to many if there is no noise, louder the noise greater is the music to them. Those of us who live in big cities have no time to think of the noise, we are conditioned by it and accustomed to it. This noise, this stress, and strain have done much damage by way of ailments. Heart disease, cancer, ulcers, nervous tension and insomnia. Most of our illnesses are caused by psychological anxiety states, the nervous tension of modern life, economic distress and emotional unrest. Nervous exhaustion in man is increasing with the speeding up of life leading to delirious excitement. People often return home after work showing signs of nervous exhaustion. As a consequence, man's concentration is weakened and mental and physical efficiency is lowered. Man becomes easily irritated and is quick to find fault and pick a quarrel. He becomes morbidly introspective and experiences aches and pains, and suffers from hypertension and sleeplessness. These symptoms of nervous exhaustion clearly show that modern man's mind and body require rest, rest of a high quality. Let us bear in mind that a certain aloofness, a withdrawing of the mind from suziness of life, is a requisite to mental hygiene. Whenever you get an opportunity try to be away from the town and engage yourself in quiet contemplation, call it yoga concentration or meditation. Learn to observe the silence. Silence does so much good to us. It is quite wrong to imagine that they alone are powerful who are noisy, garrulous and fussily busy. Silence is golden, and we must speak only if we can improve on silence. The greatest creative energy works in silence. Observing silence is important. We absolutely do that in our meditation. Thus in the Dharmapada Sutra, the Buddha taught. Look upon the world as one would look upon a bubble, just as one would look upon a mirage. If a man thus looks down upon the world, the king of death does not see him, Dharmapada 170. Suppose this world is like a brilliantly ornamented royal chariot, the foolish are immersed in it, but the wise do not attach to it, Dharmapada 171. Whoever was formerly heedless and afterwards overcomes his sloth, such a person illuminates this world just like the moon when freed from clouds, Dharmapada. 172. Whoever was formerly heedless and afterwards does good deeds, such a person illuminates this world just like the moon when freed from clouds, Dharmapada 173. 
This work is so dark that only a few can see it clearly, like birds escape from a net, but very few of them fly up straight, Dharmapada 174. 73. Old Age Sickness Death. Prince Siddhartha's perception of the old age, sickness and death, happened when he was very young. One day, with the permission from the king, Prince Siddhartha and his attendants set out a tour around the capital city. However, after exiting the east gate not long, he saw a hunchback old man with white hair and bare shoulders. The man was limping along very feebly and looked pitiful, as if he could easily be blown away just by a slight gust of wind. The prince immediately dismounted from the elephant, walked to the old man, and spoke to him in a caring manner. It turned out that the old man was deaf, with not even one tooth in his mouth. He was lonely and unprovided for because his children refused to support him. This aroused the prince's sympathy who offered to support the, the old man through his old age, but the old man only asked the prince to help bring back his rejuvenation and longevity instead. Hearing this, the prince was speechless, cited and instructed his attendants to return to the palace. A few days later, the prince and his attendants toured the west gate. Even though the king already ordered the area to be cleaned, and the sick and the poor were not allowed to stay outdoors, but not long after they set out, the prince saw a sick man lying. By the roadside on the verge of dying. He had a thin body and a bloated belly, and he was moaning. The prince asked one of his attendants. Why would the man become like this? The attendant dared not to conceal the truth, he replied. This is a sick man. He catches illness because his body is in disorder. Whether rich or poor, noble or lower classes, all have the body that is subject to disease and pain. On hearing these words, the prince felt ill and disturbed. He gave the order to return to the palace. After returning to the palace, the prince was unhappy all day long. He was wondering why people would turn old and would contract diseases. With all the luxuries he had, he did not know how to alleviate the suffering of the masses and how to make them live in more comfort. The king was aware of the unhappiness of his son, but considered this a minor incident. He persuaded the prince to continue on another tour. This time he decreed that all the people of the kingdom should help avoid any unpleasant encounters. The king even ordered Devadatta to accompany the prince, as he believed Devadatta was excellent in archery and martial arts, which could help the prince muster more courage. Not long after setting out of the south gate, they accidentally came upon a funeral procession which blocked the way of the prince's carriage. The men who walked in front looked sad, while all the women were crying miserably. The prince told Devadatta. Let's return to the palace. Devadatta laughed at the prince for his being afraid of dead people and said. The true coward prince. The prince thought, although Devadatta laugh at others, no one in the world could stay alive forever. It is only a matter of time before he joins the procession of the dead. He was then in no mood to appreciate the scenery along the way. So he returned to the palace in total silence. In all these tours, the prince always set out in high spirits but returned in a somber mood. Since then he remained silent and unhappy, despite the fact that his beautiful wife and his good son were always by his side. Images of the old, the sick and the dead, constantly haunted the mind of the prince. He thought that even his beautiful wife and baby son could not escape from the cycle of old age, sickness and death. In his mind, human life was illusionary and unreal, like images of flowers in the air or the moon in the water. Another day while in the royal garden, the prince observed the fish in the pond fighting among themselves for food, with the big fish eating the small and the small fish eating the shrimps. This was the fight for survival among living creatures, with the strong preying on the weak. As for humans, they waged wars out of selfishness. The prince was contemplating on its origin and how to stop it. Wine, women and songs could not arouse the interest of the prince, who was puzzled by the problems of old age, sickness, death, and impermanence. He wanted to seek out ways and means of emancipation from the sufferings of life. To him, this was the most important goal to achieve in human life. That was why the young prince left his beautiful wife, baby son, and the luxurious life to become a homeless mendicant. 74. Demonic Obstructions. 
a Sanskrit term for demon. Mara, an ancient Indian term, implied the evil forces that disturb our minds. These are demonic forces that cause human beings to turn away from Buddhist practice and continue to flow in the cycle of births and deaths. Demons are called Mara in Sanskrit. In Chinese, the word has connotation of murderer because demons usually plunder the virtues and murder the wisdom life of cultivators. Demons also represent the destructive conditions or influences that cause practitioners to retrogress in their cultivation. Demons can render cultivators insane, making them lose their right thought, develop erroneous views, commit evil karma, and end up sunk in the lower realms. These activities which develop virtue and wisdom and lead sentient beings to nirvana are called Buddha work. Those activities which destroy good roots, causing sentient beings to suffer and revolve in the cycle of birth and death, are called demonic actions. The longer the practitioner cultivates and the higher his level of attainment, the more he discovers how wicked, cunning and powerful the demons are. In Zen, Mara is any delusion or force of distraction. Demons are called Mara in Sanskrit. In Chinese, the word has connotation of murderer because demons usually plunder the virtues and murder the wisdom life of cultivators. Demons also represent the destructive conditions or influences that cause practitioners to retrogress in their cultivation. Demons can render cultivators insane, making them lose their right thought, develop erroneous views, commit evil karma, and end up sunk in the lower realms. These activities which develop virtue and wisdom and lead sentient beings to nirvana are called Buddha work. Those activities which destroy good roots, causing sentient beings to suffer and revolve in the cycle of birth and death, are called demonic actions. The longer the practitioner cultivates and the higher his level of attainment, the more he discovers how wicked, cunning and powerful the demons are. In the Napada Sutta, the Buddha told Mara, Sensual pleasures are your first army, discontent your second, your third is hunger and thirst, the fourth is called craving, sloth and torpor are your fifth, the sixth is called fear, your seventh is doubt, conceit, and ingratitude are your eight, the ninth is gain, renown, honor, and whatever fame is falsely received. And whoever both extols himself and disparages others has fallen victim to the tenth. This is your army, Mara the striking force of darkness. One who is not brave enough cannot conquer it, but having conquered it, one obtains happiness. Demonic obstructions can be internal devil or external devil. Internal devil or the devil in the body meaning instinctive impulses or wicked ideas that disturb our righteous minds. However, for determined or devout practitioners, such a temptation acts to strengthen their will to seek the way. As a result, the devil in the body will be served to protect the Buddha law. External devil or the devil outside the body meaning temptation or pressure from the outside. In other words, devil outside the body means the speech and conduct of those who offer temptation, criticism, disturbance, and threats to those who endeavor to practice the Buddha's teachings and spread them. Besides, there are other demonic obstructions such as temper, the god of lust, or sins. All of the above symbolize the passions that overwhelm human beings, as well as everything that hinders the arising of the wholesome roots and progress on the path of salvation and enlightenment. Mara is our greed, hatred, ignorance, pride, doubt, wrong views, evil views and all the other poisons bringing people unhappiness and grief. The temper, the murder, the destruction, or the personification of evil or death in Buddhist mythology. In Buddhism, Mara symbolizes the passions that overwhelm human beings, as well as everything that hinders the arising of the wholesome roots and progress on the path of enlightenment. Mara is the lord of the sixth heaven of the desire realm and is often depicted with a hundred arms, riding on an elephant. According to legend, the Buddha Sakyamuni was attacked by Mara as he was striving for enlightenment. Mara wanted to prevent him from showing men the way that liberates them from suffering. Mara first called up a crowd of demons, but Sakyamuni did not fear them. Then he sent his most beautiful daughter to seduce Sakyamuni, but before the Buddha's eyes, she turned into an ugly hag, whereupon Mara admitted conclusive defeat. One of the three kinds of demons. 
celestial demons refers to the type of demon that resides in the sixth heaven, also called the heaven of free enjoyment of others' emanations. This type of demon possesses merits and blessings, and enjoys the highest heavenly bliss in the realm of desire, of which our world is but a small part. They then mistake such happiness and bliss as ultimate, and do not wish anyone to escape their influence. Celestial demons constantly obstruct the Buddha truth and followers. When a practitioner has attained a fairly high level of cultivation, his mind light develops and shines up to the realm of the sixth heaven. It is then discovered by the celestial demons, who seek ways to sabotage his cultivation. Such action can take many forms, threatening or cajoling, or even helping the practitioner attain false samadhi wisdom and spiritual power, with the aim of ultimately deceiving him. These demons take turns watching the practitioner constantly and without interruption, waiting for the opportunity. If the practitioner has a delius of thought, they pounce on him or steer him toward things contrary to the way. The practitioner's entire lifetime of cultivation is then over, for all practical purposes. Demonic obstructiona can be demonic afflictions. These demons represent the afflictions of greed, anger, resentment, delusion, contempt, doubt and wrong views. They also include the demons of the five skandhas, the six entrances, the twelve sense fields, and the eighteen elements. These demons are also called internal as they created by topsy-turvy deliusive states of mind. Therefore, they must be overcome by the bright, enlightened mind. The human mind is easily moved, developing afflictions not only because of personal karma, but also because of the common karma of living in an environment filled, for the most part, with evil beings. Some persons cannot resist the attractions of the five dusts and thus fall into evil ways. Others, encountering adverse conditions, grow sad and mournful and lose their determination to progress. Such developments depending on their severity render the cultivator despondent, indignant and ill, or worse still, cause him to abandon the Buddhist order or even to commit suicide out of despair. More harmful still, they can lead to loss of respect and goodwill toward other cultivators, sometimes even hatred and avoidance of clergy and lay people alike. Loss of faith in cause and effect, bad karma and finally, descent upon the three evil paths are the end result. To counteract these demons, the practitioner should reflect that all afflictions are illusory, upsetting, suffocating, binding, evil, and conducive only to suffering for both himself and others. To eliminate afflictions is to return to the true mind, free and liberated, fresh and tranquil, bright and clear, happy and at peace, transcendental and wondrous. The cultivator should also meditate in the same way on all attachments, from the five skandhas to the eighteen elements. In the Lotus Sutra, Sakyamuni Buddha said, you should not be greedy and attached to gross and vile forms, sound, smell, taste, touch and dharmas. If you do, they will burn you up. Manjusri Bodhisattva once asked a female deity, how do you see the eighteen elements? The deity replied, they are similar to the ionic fire burning up the whole world. These are words of warning, reminding us to eliminate the demons of afflictions. If the demons of afflictions or internal demons are not subdued, they will attract external demons which wreak havoc. The ancient have said. If inside the door there are mean-spirited people, mean-spirited people will arrive at the door, if inside the door there are virtuous superior people, noble superior people will arrive at the door. As an example, when thieves try to enter a house through the side door, if the owner calmly scolds them in a loud voice, they will naturally be frightened and leave. If on the other hand, he is terrified and panic-stricken, and begs them to desist, he will unwittingly be inviting them into his house. In the awakening of faith, the patriarch Asbagasha admonished. There may be some disciples whose root of merit is not yet mature, whose control of mind is weak, and whose power of application is limited and yet who are sincere in their purpose to seek enlightenment, these for a time may beset and bewildered by Maras and evil influences, who are seeking to break down their good purpose. Such disciples, seeing seductive sights, attractive girls, strong young men, must constantly remind themselves that all such tempting and alluring things are mind-made, 
and, if they do this, their tempting power will disappear, and they will no longer be annoyed. Or, if they have vision of heavenly gods and bodhisattvas and Buddhas surrounded by celestial glories, they should remind themselves that those, too, are mind-made and unreal. Or, if they should be uplifted and excited by listening to mysterious Dharanis, to lectures upon the Paramitas, to elucidations of the great principles of the Mahayana, they must remind themselves that these also are emptiness and mind-made, that in their essence, they are nirvana itself. Or, if they should have intimations within that they have attained transcendental powers, recalling past lives, or foreseeing future lives, or reading others' thoughts, or freedom to visit other Buddha lands, or great powers of eloquence, all of these may tempt them to become covetous for worldly power and riches in vain. Or, they may be tempted by extremes of emotion, at times angry, at other times joyous, or at times very kind-hearted and compassionate, at other times the very opposite, or at times alert and purposeful, at other times indolent and stupid, at times full of faith and zealous in their practice, at other times engrossed in other affairs and negligent. All of these will keep them vacillating, at times experiencing a kind of fictitious samadhi, such as the heretics boast of, but not the true samadhi. Or later, when they are quite advanced they become absorbed in trances for a day, or two, or even seven, not partaking of any food, but upheld inward food of their spirit, being admired by their friends and feeling very comfortable and proud and complacent, and then later becoming very erratic, sometimes eating little, sometimes greedily and the expression of their face constantly changing. Because of all such strange manifestations and developments in the course of their practices, disciples should be on their guard to keep the mind under constant control. They should neither grasp after nor become attached to the passing and unsubstantial things of the senses or concepts and moods of the mind. If they do this they will be able to keep far away from the hindrances of karma. According to the Flower Adornment Sutra, Chapter 38, there are ten kinds of possession by demons of great enlightening beings. Enlightening beings who can leave these ten can attain the supreme supportive power of Buddhas. The first possession is laziness. The second possession is narrowness and meanness of aspiration. The third possession is satisfaction with a little practice. The fourth possession is exclusivity. The fifth possession is not making great vows. The sixth possession is liking to be in tranquil extinction and annihilating afflictions, forgetting the body mind. The seventh possession is permanently annihilating birth and death. The eighth possession is giving up the practices of enlightening beings. The ninth possession is not edifying sentient beings. The tenth possession is doubting and repudiating the truth. Zen practitioners should always remember that all circumstances are full of demonic obstructions. Zen practitioners should always remember these two types of demon, internal and external. Celestial demons are within the category of external demons, however, we describe them separately to alert the practitioner to the dangerous, subtle havoc they can cause. In addition to the demons of afflictions, external demons and celestial demons described above, Buddhist sutras also mention disease demons and the demons of death. For disease will usually wither the practitioner's efforts, while death in the midst of cultivation can make him retrogress. Thus, disease and death are called demons. In general, they represent obstacles to the way that affect the physical body, but they cannot harm and destroy the body mind, in the true sense of the word demon. Considering the level of cultivation of today's practitioners, they generally face harassment only from demons of afflictions or external demons. Such cultivators are not advanced enough to arouse opposition from celestial demons. However, should the latter set their minds to destroying someone, that person has little hope of escaping harm, unless his cultivation is exemplary. In the Surangama Sutra, Sakyamuni Buddha, out of compassion for cultivators faced with many dangers along the way, advised those who practiced meditation to recite mantras at the same time. This would enable them to rely on the power of the Buddhas to escape harm from demons and achieve correct samadhi. The patriarch Yin Kuang Wan said. At first glance, it would appear that the Surangama Sutra has a different viewpoint from Pure Land. 
however, upon closer scrutiny, that Zutra, in its essence, actually praised and commended the Pure Land School. Why, it is because, if even those who have attained the third level of sagehood can suffer retrogression caused by demons, we can see the crucial importance of Buddha recitation and rebirth in the Pure Land. In the gathering and helping light of the Lord Amitabha Buddha, there is no more danger of demons. Not thoroughly understanding of the Buddhist doctrines is the main reason of demonic obstructions. Most of the time, Zen practitioner does not understand the Dharma and is not skillful at reigning in his mind, letting internal demons or afflictions spring up, which, in turn, attract external demons. If he can keep his mind empty and still and recite the Buddha's name, external demons will be powerless and afflictions will gradually disappear. Thus, for the pure land practitioner, even if demonic obstacles do appear, they are few in number. Advanced Zen practitioners, on the other hand, face many demonic occurrences because they rely only on their own strength and self-power. A Zen follower should fulfill the following five conditions to be successful. If a Zen practitioner does not meet these five conditions, he is very easily subject to get harm from demons. He should keep the precepts strictly, his nature and roots should be quick and enlightened, he should have a clear understanding of the Dharma, skillfully distinguishing the correct from the deviant. The true from the false, he should be firm and stable in his determination, he should be guided by a good advisor, who has a thorough understanding of the sutras and many years experience in meditation. This is the end of this video, thank you for listening. Please continue to support and help this channel grow. As you already know, Buddha emphasized the importance of generosity supporting the spread of the Dharma for spiritual growth, we can cultivate this virtue in our digital age. Now I need your help spreading the Buddha teaching further by subscribing, liking, and sharing our channel, you're supporting the dissemination of valuable teachings, much like this Sangha was supported in the past. Your engagement accumulates positive karma for you and helps make the Dharma accessible to a wider audience, a meritorious act indeed. Let's do this with pure intentions, free from attachment and selfishness, fostering a sense of community and supporting our own spiritual journey. These principles, rooted in Buddhist ethics, continue to guide us. You will receive great blessings for supporting the propagation of Buddha's teachings in a very simple way by subscribing, liking, and sharing to help spreading the Buddha teaching to all human being. Wishing you and your family always have a peaceful and happy life.